I know there's light in the world. I see it in the eyes of my sisters who call me the best big brother in the world every time I grab happiness out of them with a chocolate bar. I hear it in my friends' condescending laughter they force out whenever I go out on a tangent about the validity of Chuck E. Cheese pizza. I feel it in the hearts of strangers who smile at me. But overall, I see it in the sky. Maybe pop like a sun up. That big orange thing our ancestors praise. Astrology girl star stuff with. Love my old goth girl baddies, by the way. Mommy. <laughs> Children draw sunglasses on and white people oil up to avoid the sun. If I've ever known or felt true warmth, then God knows that all my memories metaphorically are encapsulated by this shiny beacon of light that hovers above us like a shonen antagonist. But it's only up for 10 hours. Like all good things, the sun inevitably passes and with it comes the uncertainty of the night. I've always been more accustomed to this time of existence, metaphorically because of the silence that seems to accompany this dysutopian realm of actuality, but literally because insomnia kind of predisposed me to be a sad little boy. Me 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 mental, mental, mental health in shambles, insomnia. Not to downplay the fright of the night. I too still run up the stairs as fast as I can after flipping off the light switch. And yes, it's because I think the demon here on Yang Kishibu is living in my walls. But regardless, being is painful, and you may think the light just hides the woes of the dark. But besides the metaphor, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I hate living. I hate living. I hate living. I hate that I have to keep on losing every bit of joy that falls onto my lap. I don't see my little sisters anymore. They've been stripped of me because of tragic experiences. Pertaining to systems of disenfranchisement, the light would have you forgot existed. I don't hear my friends around me. Their voices have been swallowed by a vacuum of inanimate terror which the sun would have you believe is the dark's fault. But I still see strangers. All I see is strangers now. Strangers who don't know who I am. Strangers who want me to embody some form of black glamour that they want to publicize into a PR stunt. Strangers who wouldn't care if I existed or not, as long as there was some other body capable of doing what I do at a fraction of the cost. The sun and the moon work in tandem. They're both oppressive forces that dictate every second of my existence, whether I allow them to or not. But why do we only bask in the sun? Or rather, why do I still care for the sun's rays if they just hide what the inevitable night will show me? Why do I still search for the light in the night when this oxymoron of existence is one I know that cannot exist? I know this metaphor is wrong. Of course it's wrong. I, I lived in it. I know what's trying to trick me. But if the sun and the moon and all its wonders can stop existing, for a brief period of time. Dear God, why can't I? I don't want to leave. I don't want to cease to exist. I just want to fade and cycle the same way all things do. But existing is seeing the light and the dark and discerning. It's awful, but it's what I must do in order to survive. I want to start this video by implicitly stating that I don't want to fuel suicidal ideation. This video is a think piece surrounding survival in tandem with conformity to bodies of presence that will always be there. I get that living is hard, but I still believe that it has value. This might sound like a conundrum, and, and let me tell you, in the same way that I'm a 6 foot 5 man that's scared of heights, sometimes anomalies are better felt and emphasized through another's experience. For the past couple months, I've been dealing with a silly little boy called survivor's guilt. I say silly because I made it out of the night, right? The worst experiences of poverty and disenfranchisement are behind me, right? I shouldn't ever be depressed. I mean, I'm a YouTuber. Some people have to make TikTok videos for a living. Soldier. Pretty boy. Sweet. I'm definitely more on the positive side of art, right? I'm sorry. I love my TikTokers. No hate to my TikTokers. I love y'all dancing ring like queens, okay? Turn that RGB light into rainbow for me, okay? Get, 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 get RBG down, baby. <laughs> However, it seems like my whole life has been ruled by this metaphorical sun of Western priorities and moon of disenfranchised, dystopian, genuine joy literally since I've been born. I mean, being born in some refugee camp because some European country wanted a little bit of oil so they bomb your people is kind of an extreme example of this Western sun enforcing its democratic views upon me, but hey, I'm just a little boy. I'm just a little boy with dimple. I'm Flamingo. Quack. 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 He be quacking. Quack. <laughs> and the funniest thing is, I was happiest when I was most impoverished. 
I used to live in this small community of Southern Sudanese immigrants in townhouses on the north side of my city. Every day I'd walk to school with my cousins, run outside and knock on their doors whenever I was bored and just wanted to play, dribble a basketball until the street lights went on, and one of our parents would come back and yell at us for missing curfew. And trust me, black parents don't play about them street lights. It's like an invisible alarm clock that you're supposed to know better than your times tables. But all that changed with accumulating debt and the age of maturation. Yes, the sun caused me to live in this oppressive environment, impoverished and starving for food on a nigh daily basis. But I still had the moon. The moon being this beacon of hope in a disenfranchised area, which soothed me from the terrors of the light. Imagine little me, little boy me, five-year-old me with no tooth, head full of indoctrinated gospel and buzz cut vibes. My auntie used to work at this Walmart by my house. And one day she came home with a movie called Spy Kids 2. The only problem was that it was a 3D movie and there was only one pair of red and blue retro 3D glasses in the box. Welcome to the 2000s. We, 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 we did not get 3D like y'all, I'm sorry. And at this point, I had never seen a 3D movie in my life. 3D was a new thing. I remember sitting in front of the TV with my cousins, passing the glasses around once in a while. And yes, the majority of my experience with this movie was looking at a jarring mess of red and blue. But I was with my family, and I had popcorn <laughs> at 8 p.m. on a school night. That's the equivalent to still being out at like 7 a.m. in adult years. However, as happy as this experience was, the sun did what the sun does. It rose. Western priorities started beaming upon us. We needed money, and perceivably to my parents, crime was becoming rampant in the area. We needed a safer place to stay. Thus, I moved south, still in a townhouse, but in a more safer area, away from my community, away from my cousins, away from that Spy Kids 2 movie that gave me so much joy, but it was a safer area, so we were happier, right? And when it came to maturity, I lived my preteens here, and inevitably, when I hit 15, the beaming sun of Western priorities came back down to shine upon me. Yeah. I now had to work in order to just enjoy life. Go on field trips, see my friends outside of school, etc. In fact, I've been working for so long, I've been in a burnout ever since I could remember. Work has been synonymous with life for me at this point. This burnout is directly fueled by forces that have thrown a metaphorical ladder down the hole of poverty that I was in. And then they expected me to climb. And with every handle I pulled myself up from, it seems that three more appeared. The only thing fueling me during that climb, and even now, is survivability. And yes, I've finally gotten to the point where I have a stable platform, a healthy circle of friends, and a great support system. But with that, inevitably, I'm gonna have to leave my family in a disenfranchised area. I've had to conform to social norms that box me in to be a figure of prominence that I've never wanted to be, or else I'm kicked back down that ladder and I have to start again. I just wanted to have money, and with that, I assumed that comfortability would follow. But the age-old story of making it out of the hood really ignores the brightest parts about these disenfranchised areas that make it such a positive, connected community to be a part of. The scariest part of my life, though, is how this pedestal comes with a severe downside. If I slip, it's right back down to that hood. I don't have systems of connections, which would grant me opportunities for lucrative wealth. I'm the first one that's actually made it up this capitalistic ladder. It's now up for me to throw the ladder down and provide a fast pass for everyone I've left behind, at least in my parents' and siblings' eyes. And if I slip, it's right back down to one meal a day. It's right back to eight hour work shift, five days straight. It's right back to economic oppression. And as much as I love the camaraderie of my family, that life was depressing. So on one side, we have the sun being money and contortions of economic squalor, the glitz and the glamor, the checks I'm getting every month, the platform, the potential to travel, the business connections, the happiness of financial safety. And on the other hand, we have what the sun hides, the moon. The camaraderie of my black peers, whose heartwarming bonds the sun wants me to neglect. My little sister's hugs the sun views as inadequate in the grand scheme of capitalism. My friends, the sun wants me to leave my friends and seek out my own financial laissez-faire. And in the middle of these two celestial bodies is me. I'm in this in-between space between the sun and the moon. And in a way, we all are. There's means to conform in normalized social settings and cultural norms which most of us normal people are going through. Throughout your life, you may be less restricted by the sun in terms of gender presentation, 
racial dynamics or anti-blackness. But this glimpse of the sun in this depressing hole is still there. We still feel it. And thus we must move in accordance to finding the light. The more we teeter to the light, the less we're associated with the dark. We're living in technicolor, from the white to the black experience, from the trans to the cis experience, to the economically privileged to the poverty stricken experience. The joy of conformity being praised is a ruse by the sun's rays in order to keep us in check. So tell me, how do you climb this ladder of in-betweens? Hey, this is Turb on Turb.com, located at Turb Enterprise from Turb head he headquarters and, and welcome to Turb. Can you quack? Watching me have an existential on screen wasn't in the books today, but hey, thank thank the leftist cooks. Thank the leftist cooks. They did this. They did this to me. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Start a video essay. I mean, it's been about four videos since my last mental breakdown. I guess we gotta have another one, you know? Good old mental health here when you need it. <laughs> I've been lacking, and a mental breakdown at this point of my career is kind of definite. I'm not God's strongest soldier. My brain is held together by silly glue and Play Doh mold. This is my Patreon. If you want to get that juicy couple of videos that are behind the scenes and support me as a creator, I know you want to do it. Come on, click, 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 <laughs> click. And I'll be so happy that I'll do a little happy dance. I'm a TikToker. I'm a TikToker first. This ain't what you want. This ain't what you want. This is what you get if you subscribe to the Patreon. You get them, you get them dancing. Can you do a little quack for us? <laughs> Today's topic is depression and survivability in the Western world, specifically survivability from a marginalized experience and the pursuit of happiness inside of a structure that forces you to relieve aspects of your persona, experiences, and connections with peers to grasp a small glimpse of this Western life. And just like that, can you start the video? <laughs> Thumbnail, he quacked. <laughs> Act one, structure. Everyone wants to be a part of something. Everyone wants to be included. A basketball, soccer ball, or bowling ball are pretty dope things to have. Although recreationally, I don't see why you'd have a bowling ball inside of your house. Unless you're bowling stroke game week and you need to overcompensate by training in your basement for your first dates or something. But at that point, just play Wii Sports. I think that would generally help. Regardless, the game of life, ironically, isn't played singularly. Actually it is, but if you sit in a room and play the game of life on a Nintendo Switch all by yourself, I feel like the call is coming from inside the house. Ring, 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 ring. Isolation. Perb, come up with a more intricate metaphor for isolation. Fine! I correlate isolation to confinement. Imagine being underground, stuck, with your only companion being a rat and a slice of pizza that you found because you're in a- Turb, this is the plot to Ninja Turtles. And did you not just type up synonyms for isolation on Google and click on the first thing you saw? Okay, depression fucking sucks, it sucks. Furthermore, the anxiety of wanting to be seen in your desolate space of existence caused by structures of social norms slowly eats you alive. No matter how hashtag destroy lonely opium misunderstood you think you are, humans are social creatures. We see connections on all avenues of our experiences. We want camaraderie. We want love. We want to be appreciated. We want to fit in. We want to experience genuine compassion at all stages of our life. You're a YouTuber. The call's coming from inside the house. That's the only time you'll ever see my legs. Only time you'll ever see Turb's legs. And frankly, it sucks when the Western world frames our needs of happiness as insatiable. Like in schooling, maybe you have ADHD. Or maybe authoritative figures. Maybe you have an oppressive or patriarchal parent. Or racist institutions. Maybe your community is regularly patrolled and over-policed by cops. Like, like life, man. Like life. Like life. Like life. It genuinely sucks. I mean, everywhere you go, every community, no matter how big or small, understands this. There's an aspect of human nature that appeals to camaraderie. 
Take the YouTube world for example. If you lack a partner or a means to emotional security, the Dr. Eggmans of this digital space of existence would have you believe that this is woman's fault. That modern society induced in feministic injustice fails to recognize the patterns of male introspection. Then have you hate the world for the lack of compassion you're missing in your daily life. And yes, this is partially true. Black men are treated as hypermasculine figures because of BBC minstrelsy. Asian men are treated as gay characters outside of the realms of masculine representation. But they don't tell you that. They feed you lies and further you into believing that patriarchal notions of masculinity will save you. When this social construct is the same thing engulfing all of our experiences. In the same way, if you lack a voice and want your struggles to be heard, Real life politicians in prominent positions of power will have you believing that they are the solution while actively turning your pleas of change into the next scripture of legislature which pushes you further into oppression. We saw this with BLM. The next year they essentially upped the police fund and are actively working on making cop cities all around America. Hell they just made one in Atlanta! These politicians essentially preach that if you stand them like 16 year old girls ride for Jamin, you will be a part of a societal revolution of change. Your teachers or coaches or people in prominent positions of power will bend their authority into making you hope to be of status or prominence in each respectable realm applicable to it. Maybe you want to go to uni and your teacher hypes you up and says you you a good good little boy, you can read, you a good little boy, you can read. Maybe you want to be an NBA player and your coach says you a good little boy, you can dribble a basketball, you a good little boy, you can dribble a basketball. They do this all while leading you through treacherous paths of educational, athletic, or even sometimes downright coercive physical situations. And don't even get me started on the need for money. Capitalism! Inflation doesn't work the way that you were taught in schools. Capitalism. Houses around 40 years ago in LA, like Inglewood, were worth around 100,000. Now most of them are at a million. Capitalism. So if you're not making Hassan type of bank, sorry for party rocking. Capitalism. I mean, yeah, but can I just be happy with some money and a cool little girlfriend? Capitalism. Capitalism. Okay, can I just joke around and be a silly little boy and hang with my friends? You have to pay for Netflix now, you have two dollars in your bank account. Capitalism. Capitalism. Okay, I get that capitalism is this hierarchical sphere engulfing my relationships, personal life, family life. I mean, my very well being. But can I just stay at home and play Animal Crossing, fish by the lake, and hit down trees until a spider eventually forced to participate in a society that doesn't care about you? Unless you want to be homeless. I mean, it seems like I can't do anything. There's so much structure that's prohibiting me from finding happiness. I just want to. Be not afraid. Oh my god, is that Jesus? I'm a heavenly figure of justice and I rule over this- So you made this all up? No, I didn't. But if you turn to me, I promise everything will be alright in the ground- Aren't you supposed to be like, 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 not that skin tone, maybe? Not that skin tone? Fear not my skin tone, brother. Turn to America, for it was made to heal all injustices of man that- Everything is a lie. Even the God in which we, in good faith, try to tie into hymns of manifested importance, like some kind of savior that will eventually lead us out of this capitalistic rapture. Everything is flawed. We live in a neoliberal state that would much rather fund a war in Ukraine than give Flint, Michigan water. We live in a state that actively burns or bans books that justly so criticize the foundations of what the Western world is built on. DeSantis, search it up. And the more we live and actively participate in the structure of societal abyss, the more we realize it. Yes, you could conform. You could give into this lie of capitalistic or patriotic merit and forget the fight. <laughs> the fight is depressing after all. Forget it. We constantly lose anyways. America has won almost every single war against real revolution it's ever participated in. But where would this conformity lead you? Right back to accepting your material conditions as a justified reality. Right back into justifying hate crimes done on black people because the cops are supposedly the good guys. Right back into toxic frames of thoughts that you just have to drown in THC. That last one was a little trauma dumpy. <laughs> Drugs sometimes bad as a method of catharsis, please do them in moderation. But not conforming leads us into a depression of fighting a system that's actively winning, all the while scolding us and painting us as crazy for not believing in it. It tells us we're the issue, not the structure of governments 
or the laws, or people that embody systems of servitude which erase our voices. We, the marginalized people, just wanting to have a voice, are the issue. We are the woke culture of society that must be stopped. The woke agenda. In order to avoid hate crimes, constant nagging, or disenfranchisement, conforming needs to be done to differing extents in order to have a safe existence. Because that's what we all want at the end of the day, right? The truth is, revolution against one of the most powerful nations to ever exist is hard, and we might not get to see it in our lifetime. But at the same time, conforming for the sake of some idealization of grandeur presented in the Western world is just delirious. I mean, come on, statistically speaking, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer, especially if you're not an unmelanated munchkin. At this point in hypercapitalistic society, most of us can't even retire till we're like, New research shows that a shift from defined benefit retirement plans, pensions, to defined contribution plans, 401ks, is exacerbating income equality and poorly preparing the majority of Americans for their retirement. Old age can't save you! You will work until you're 80! Wow, we can't even retire? Honestly, why are we still even here? The structures of capitalism in the Western world is failing to provide the majority of us with basic human necessities. Students are leaving schools with debt in the 100Ks. Houses cost you about three livers on the black market. And video games are like $100 a piece now, with the most shitty gameplay on release. No, I'm not talking about Hogwarts. If you play this game, I hope your sleep paralysis steaming. Besides that, Avada Kedavra, your first born. Childlike joy isn't lost with age because of innocence. It's lost because you realized how beyond saving your social conditions are. My first moments of exuberance in placed with societal joy was not with a video game, but with Obama. They ask me who cares, I say Obama, Obama, Obama care, Obama, 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 Obama cares, Obama, Obama. <laughs> a black president with an all black family that spoke with so much authority that he demanded a presence. Me, a black little boy, was like, wow, mom, look at that dude, he just like, he just like me, just like me for real. Then he became a neo-black elitist and then, wait, I'm getting a, I'm getting a, I'm getting a call. Well, actually, Terp, I have something to say about that. Say what you say. When I was in the first grade, I remember Obama getting elected as president um, I'd stayed up most of that night with my family and it was such a big celebration and you know the next day at school I was so excited to tell everyone like Obama got elected as president we have the first black president you know because people would say you know one day we would have a black president but you know by that age already dealing with racism I just thought that it was something that was never going to happen um, I just thought that it was something that was idealistic that people would say and you know, when Obama got elected, like, it meant so much to me to, like, look on the TV and see someone that looked like me. And, you know, I went to school the next day so excited, running around telling everyone, we have the first black president, we had a first black president. And I was kind of obsessed with it, you know, I would do it almost every day. Um, and people were happy with me until one day I went to one of my friends and I said, we got Obama, you know. Aren't you happy that we have a black president? And she looked at me and she said, Obama deported my mom. And that was just really heartbreaking for me because, you know, being a second generation immigrant by this time I already knew what it meant um, when someone got deported. So to hear that, you know, Obama deported her mom, like, I was like, no, like, Obama wouldn't do that. And like, I still get kind of like emotional about it because like, I was just like, no, like, you know, Obama. And me and her, like, we, we kind of cried about it. And, you know, I was telling her that like, I was sorry, but you know, like it just really sucks that even like some of your biggest role models, you know, as a child, you grow up or you don't even get a chance to grow up because you have to grow up right there and, you know, realize that they're part of the system too, or that they're part of this imperialistic superpower that's oppressing other groups of people. And, you know, like it was, it was just really, it 
it was a tough reminder. <laughs> it was a heartbreaking reminder that the system can't be beat from the inside. Is that my symbol of hope? That was a prop, Flamingo. Don't worry, Patreons. I, I, I'd i never waste your money like that. Click on patreonturb.com, patreonturb.com. In the same way, although patriarchal, white supremacist, and fascist, Trump rallied the voices of white America as some sort of hero. Apparently, the country was in shambles. America was supposed to be great again. Lifted truck sanctions were at an all-time high. Fact check that. I don't think that's really real. I don't think that last one was really real. I just thought that was a little funny because conservatives drive big truck <laughs> and that is one because I said so. But all this white supremacist hero digging, conjuring up relics of white supremacist America, all it did was cause some neo-Nazis to storm the White House because of some tantrum pertaining to getting beat by a Mesozoic era fossil during the election. <laughs> I mean the man's still trying to run again while profiting off the same mistake that he caused in America in Palestine. Trump isn't good with trains. Trump isn't good with trains. Trump isn't good with trains. Search it up. Go with Trump's policies were a lot like the ones that caused the Palestine incident. I put it on the screen. Don't retweet me, you CSGO player. You CSGO, you CSGO player. Hey Turb, editing Neil from the future here. Uh, Mr. Donald Trump also just got arrested, so Life moved pretty fast, I guess. We're going to see how things work out for white supremacist America. Thoughts and thoughts and prayers with the, all those all those people. So back to the video. But at the end of the day, I don't want to die. I want to survive. I want to have the happy life the West promised me as a refugee. Suffering in a camp all those decades ago. I want so badly to have a space of existence. And it's getting hard to even see. God. Can you even Can show, you me? show me? Act two, spiritual relativity. I remember what it feels like to play. Play with the ideals of grandeur the West showed me. What it felt like to hope for something more than what poverty constricted me into. Essentially, I remember when I experienced the world with the gleam of distorted passion. But I also remember what it feels like to be in a pitfall of despair. Trials and tribulations of a capitalistic society that come with being black and disenfranchised are not alien to me. Shouting out for help, in whatever way I could, and receiving no help, even as a kid, was not alien to me. Church was a big part of my personal experience with hope. It was always something that gave me glimmers of life as a child, but not the actual church. I kinda hated it. Waking up at 7 a.m. just to have your face oiled up like the hood of a new Chrysler some suburban dad just got as a Christmas gift isn't really the best experience in the world. Not gonna lie, isn't the best experience in the world. Is it Chrysler or Corvette? I don't know, not my tax bracket. But it was just never my thing. If y'all enjoy looking like a butter bun biscuit at 7 a.m. during a morning breakfast at Waffle House, cool. All the power to you, all the power to Jesus and, and, and faith and, and all that faith stuff, oil face stuff. But that just was never me. At church, I had many obligations. I had to forcibly perform an act of kindness with my peers and relatives. And whenever I didn't leave a good impression, I'd be beat. I had to go up to the altar as I was one of the only kids that could read whole scriptures and preach or do a reading or two. Again, being one of only four kids trained to carry out these tasks in our Edmontonian Southern Sinise community, not showing up was disappointing the whole of people that I wanted love and admiration from. Therefore, I never missed a day. I was always an hour early. Even when the doors to the masses weren't open yet, there I was sitting in front of the church in my car with my dad listening to some cassettes that he just found from a thrift shop. BGE, before gentrification era. I helped the priest count change after the mass was done and even comfort him while he complained about the lack of funding that we were getting from this specific community. As if we weren't all just some newly displaced refugees looking for some spiritual method of catharsis. But as bad faith as this all was, after church I'd see my cousins for a while. We'd play basketball or go downstairs and bicker amongst ourselves at the kids' table. And maybe if we were really, really good. When we passed by McDonald's, my dad would acknowledge the existence of it. And I might have marginally, slightly, um, just a little incitizy, bitsy, 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 begged for it. Maybe I begged for it while pressing my head against the window and uttering sentences that I learned from white boys on Disney. Thank you, Zach and Cody. Or at least that's what my mom would say. This was my reality. 
This is what I did on Sundays. I didn't know any better except to perform as best as I could or I'd be beat. That was my objective reality. A trauma bond of fate I didn't know at the moment was one. Later on, the best part of church, and a big part of my now romanticized childlike wonder, was this idea of someone looking out for me. Specifically the spiritual relativity, faith being this disembodied spirit or energy, or more specifically in my mind, a person, that wanted nothing more than to see me smile and live a happy life. But as comforting as an idea as that was, when I called out for a hand, there was no one there to comfort me, but a belt, an unforgiving piece of letter that mercilessly reminded me that I was alone. And while I was crying, isolated on the floor from those lashings, it came again to get me harder when I cried for too long. There was no one to reaffirm my self-worth in an all-white Catholic school, just teachers telling my parents kids will be kids when slurs were used against me. But even through these treacherous experiences of adolescence, I kept hope. Because as a good little Catholic boy, I had to keep the faith in order to be worthy of forgiveness from a belt, from my peers, and from the society who shunned me for existing. And in my mind, I was thinking, some guy died on a cross 2,000 years ago and single-handedly was basically responsible for me able to live joyously. I was joyous in the present moment. But my CPTSD, my nightmares of this joyous existence, and the scars in my body would tell you otherwise. I was compartmentalizing and seeing everything around me as justified because I was a sinner. Apparently, me being born was a sin. I'm a sin. Thus, everything inflicted upon me in tandem is justified under my sinful existence. This fear manufactured into an internal voice in my head. Theob, don't say that word. God would be so mad. Theob, don't cry after being beat. God wants you to respect your parents' wishes. Theob, just smile. They're only saying that about your skin because they're friends. I'd hit myself, internally tear myself down, all for the sake of some internalized being I thought was making my life the best he could. One story I resonated the most with in my Bible studies was the story of Job. A man who fell into the same cynical joke of Catholic tyranny. For the people who haven't painstakingly taken decades of Bible study, here's the story on the screen. This legend concerns Job, a prosperous man of outstanding piety. Satan acts as an agent provocator to test whether or not Job's piety is rooted in merely his prosperity. But faced with the appalling loss of his possessions, his children, and finally his own health, Job still refuses to curse God. Three of his friends then arrive to comfort him. And at this point, the poetic dialogue begins. The poetic discourses, which probe the meaning of Job's sufferings and the manner in which he should respond, consist of three cycles of speeches that contains Job's disputes with his friends and his conversations with God. Job proclaims his innocence and the injustice of his suffering, while his comforters argue that Job is being punished for his sins. Job, convicted of his faithfulness and uprightness, is not satisfied with this explanation. The conversation between Job and God resolves the dramatic tension but without solving the problem of undeserved suffering. The speeches evoke Job's trust in the purposeful activity of God, in the affairs of the world, even though God's ways with man remain mysterious and inscrutable. Inscru inscrutable. Inscrutable. It's gonna basically God and Satan terrorize this man for the vine. Pronouncing things incorrectly. Yudubay, stum blupon. Inscrutable. They did it for the gram. After Job was done suffering and basically on the brink of starvation, God hopped out and said, it's just a prank, bro. And then the confetti fell and everyone was just like, ha 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 ha, ha, ha that's God. Ha, 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 that's, look at him. He works, in, he works in mysterious ways. But all jokes aside, this story kind of told me, a poverty stricken refugee, this will all be all right if you just hope. And while a decade and a half later, Admittedly, the promise was kind of true, being reminiscent right now with my positive platform and thriving community. But this isn't a God's plan gotcha moment. I'm sorry, Drake. This is... <laughs> Change only came to me when I allowed that fabric of my reality to collapse and for hundreds of coincidences to occur that all started with a pebble. Yes, the tragic ending to my spiritual journey came in tandem with a pebble, a pebble that shattered my reality. Slowly over the years, less and less people would go to church until it was only one or two families. Me and a couple of other oiled up little dudes in the pews. <laughs> this was because of a variety of reasons like moving, working, or because my white priest in a black church lashed out after one of the attendances had 20 people and told us all to be ashamed mid-mass service, leading to a lot of people rightfully realizing that this church only wanted our money from us currently poor individuals who were already working three jobs to make ends meet while purposely booking out Sundays for some money-grubbing pig. So I guess you could, I, I guess you could say it could be anything. I guess, or it's just social consciousness and people don't 
give a fuck about fucking priests or fucking love buddy. But after one particular mass, I didn't know it would be my last. I'm rhyming today. I'm rhyming. <laughs> Me and my cousins were throwing rocks and playing as kids do. This is one of the last times I had the light of faith in my eyes. We got the bright idea to see who could throw these rocks the furthest. The next thing we knew, a stained glass window was broken. The biggest one in front of the church. I don't know if I did it or not, as I was gleefully playing in the moment, but it was blamed on me, and I was then yelled at at everyone, present in my clergy, for being an abomination, disappointment, dealing with the devil, beat with the pan, electronics taken away, no basketball for three months, all for wanting to play. Then we never went to church again out of shame. But don't worry, there weren't that much people at that church anyway. It's not like I was giving total and complete hell. Or maybe that's my compartmentalization again. I don't know. Childhood PTSD. I'm not downplaying the church with my own experiences because mine are somewhat extreme. I realize that I'm black and I'm a refugee, a direct product of one of the most bloodiest civil wars in existence. In place in an area that's alien to dealing with the struggles of people like me. Some people have good stories about being a Catholic, Christian, star girl, entrepreneur, BTS stan. By the way, star girls, how does the house of Pluto work? Isn't that just not a planet anymore? How do you classify that? Planets are a social construct. More so with this conversation, I felt like we had to shine a light on spirituality's exploitation of disenfranchised or marginalized individuals. Sometimes, and in my case most definitely, Catholicism and aspects of spirituality in the Western world are manufactured to make us conform to the oppressive society around us. Even the Bible itself is co-opted. Put yourself in some BC shoes, the Jesus 15s, you know, Sladimus. Put them out. Maybe they're a little yassified and they got some MLP stickers or something. Or wolves. Wolves that look like cool humans. We love furries. Anyways, while you're walking around in your glorified, uncommodified, suburban dad 990s, picture the world around you. Feel the air. It's humid to the point where you can taste the times that be. The hard roads of dust metaphorically intertwining with the exploitive labor enacted by the Romans. The stone buildings with wide windows to combat humidity. Hear the sounds of beautiful people surrounded by families of love. But above all, see one thing. This gargantuan structure of your faith. The jewel of your city. The temple of Jerusalem. Surrounded by a faithful community of Jewish people indulging in practices of communal love. Even with all of its beauties, Jerusalem was still corrupt. Sadducees, Pharisees, high priests, and lawmakers bent the Bible to their wombs, deeming their practices appropriate through manipulated Bible scriptures, oppressive religions, spears of philosophical disenfranchisement, and many other spears of economic disenfranchisement. All of these metaphorical and physical sociological powers were set up by design to serve the Roman overlords who cared more about lining their pockets than reaffirming people of the Jewish faith, to the point where to grasp powers, leaders in the Jewish faith like the Heridians, were in cahoots with the money grubbing, in Percy Jackson terms. Zeus meet riding Roman elites. If you were in proximity to relative power and wealth like the preachers of the past were, there was a very good chance that you were oppressing your fellow brethren in the realms of faith, spirituality, and economic servitude in order to live in squalor. The Pharisees and Sadducees made up the Sanhedrin, which I may not be saying right. I may not be saying that one right. A council of people who made decisions for Jewish people a political elite that deemed how, when, and where faith was applicable in a political sense. And again, mostly for the favor of the, the, the dick riding Romans. The grand temple that we're seeing right now, the Temple of Jerusalem, contained an offerings table, in good faith, meant to serve God through material gifts that would manifest into spiritual blessings. And I don't disagree with this practice. My mom and I burned incense for spiritual cleansing. Comparing the two, it's a little bit less of a costly activity, but the idea of spiritualistic merit in return for burning this materialistic product is pretty much the same, but oppression ripples through time. And it remained a constant that these institutional offerings of wealth only go as far as to lining the next manipulator's pockets. We saw it in the 1800s with tithes made to kings of Europe in order to secure a spot in heaven. By the way, starving a whole group of people and starving them to the point where they give up on life and surrender their bodies, minds, and wealth to another one that they can't even perceive because anything that they're living in right now is, is way more hellish than anything they could even fathom is a little out of hand. We can agree, right? Right? Yes? No? Then die! Or in the 2000s where the Vatican constantly bends its white patriotic fan bases in allegiance to the power that be. No, for real, the Pope is kind of like Jamin puppeteering its little Twitter conglomerate in order to do its pitting. 
The Vatican funded Nazis, guys. The Vatican helped Hitler. Damn, the more I hear about that guy, the more I don't like him. He's a Catholic. That's why I don't like him. And many other colonial states in order to do their evil bidding in Africa, Asia, South America, North America, in return for a bigger crop of people to deceive and torment. The Vatican is a historically manifested result of centuries of economic oppression. The same scripture co-opted in the Bible, which depicts offering all you have as a good thing, is inherently colonist. Jesus did not rate that. While he was at the temple watching the crowd place down offerings into the temple treasury, he saw tons of rich people throwing money into the offering booth. But then a poor widow threw in two cents and he went a little sick among, just a little sick, just a little sick, just a little sick. He called his disciples and proclaimed, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more money into the treasury than all others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. In this passage, Jesus is acknowledging this woman's commitment to faith under colonial co-opted forces of spirituality. He doesn't praise the widow for giving all she has. He praises the widow for still trying to give while having nothing with good intentions. And he highlights that this money that she's so forthcoming with wasn't made from the exploitation of her peers. But who knows if that woman is really blind to the perils of her society or not. Not like we could go ask her. That was that was a little 2000 year ago, little little story. So maybe not. All we know is that she's still trying. She still has hope. And Jesus thinks this is beautiful. And it's kind of proclaimed when he talked. Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. And for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished more severely. Jesus had a dream, basically. His dream was to instill social consciousness among the masses. Rich people are bastards. Or ACB. Jesus, Jesus was ACB. I bet he swung on a Roman soldier. At least once. I hope he did. Basically, though, Jesus said the reason why this woman was poor and why we shouldn't praise elites is because these men's monopolies on the housing markets are actively poisoning the same community they say they're serving. These men have a monopoly on the food we eat a monopoly on the electricity we have, a monopoly on the cars we drive, a monopoly in space, somewhere where we don't even have any active settlement in, a monopoly in schools. Hell, capitalism is just meat riding colonial forces. They're just meat riding exploitative forces. Here, even in my heavy disregard to Catholic faith, there's still a lesson to be learned. There's no reason why we should give teachers a law respect. Being politicians, billionaires, or people in respect of power. Take that Elon Musk Roman Emperor PFP off of your Twitter profile, please. It's 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 not it's not serving. It's not giving. It's, it's <laughs> people in power oppress us and make the world worse while constantly making their actions seem admirable. Elon Musk isn't some billionaire boy genius trying to make the world a better place. He's an apartheid baby who garnered the majority of his wealth through co-opting patents of ideas like Tesla. DeSantis isn't the next leader saving us from the woke mob of ideals. He's a genocide contributor, furthering anti-trans, black, and disabled policies in Florida, leaving a trail of burned books and, sadly, trans bodies in his wake. Jeff Bezos isn't a self-made man who rose to power by pulling himself up by his bootstraps, losing the majority of his wealth in a divorce with an evil woman. He's an exploiter, an anti-unionizer, enacting his position of prominence to carry out violent anti-lobbyist scare tactics in order to keep Amazon as cost-efficient as possible. And as much as I hate modern-day Catholicism, I have to disconnect what religion means in my mind when I critique it. Catholicism and all its branches, being Christianity and evangelicalism, did I say that right? <laughs> has been co-opted in order to keep black children in the Congo, South Africa, Ghana, South Sudan, conditioned into believing their bigoted state of living made by white imperialists is in accordance with the will of God. Essentially, they teach, God wants me in an adoption home in order to cure my own savageness. God wants me to be a good woman or man, so I should be gender conforming in my sexuality and presentation. God doesn't like when I speak my language. God wants me to kill my person in order to live a more grand life than what I have right here. When no, these religions have spoiled what spirituality means in and around us. True Catholicism, most of the time, is a very beautiful thing. But the co-opted manifestations of it in Western society contribute to some of the most evil forms of exploitations that one can even fathom. I look at my little sisters and sadly they fall into the perils of co-opted servitude, who in the same way I was as a kid, are scared, 
scared into a box of self-pity and shame because of this disillusioned figure of God. This co-opted figure religion has made plays a role in anti-trans legislation worldwide and in the Western world, where bodies of communities outright deny trans existence in very, very violent ways. This box also affects you, as right now you're living in the Western world, built off of white supremacist Christian values. What you decide to unpack and what you decide to do with that information is up to you. But stay woke and don't let anyone tell you that it's a bad thing to question your faith. Don't let anyone tell you that it's a bad thing to question what's oppressing you because even if it's not religion blinding us from rebelling against our material reality, there's still actors out there actively using anti-black rhetoric, anti-trans rhetoric, gender binary rhetoric, instilling oppressive policies and social conditioning on us. Whether it's political figures telling you that everything will all be right if you just give them a little votey vote, just click the button, click click the like, like and subscribe on Bernie Sanders and black people. Yay! He marched with MLK, come on, he'll save us. <laughs> <laughs> the Democrats literally do this every year with black people and racism. Then act like racism magically disappeared whenever they're instilled into office. Hey, you, you voted for us. You, you don't need to. You don't need to talk about racism any Democrats. <laughs> Not co-signing conservatives though. Democrats are sadly the closest party we have um, to communism. So uh, do do with that what you will. There's only two parties. It's fascism or or. A, a, a little bit more acceptable fascism P pick pick a side or with the teachers that tell you that you have the same economic opportunities as the kid whose family is literally funding their college tutors and extracurriculars or officers who use their billions of dollars to actively oppress marginalized communities and then kill us for stating the fact that they do society is a cornucopia of gaslighting and religion is just an apple in the pig's mouth. So how do we possibly carry on and survive in a time of neo-fascist rule? Act three, freedom. The oppressive conditions of society, be it with its frivolous political actors, members, systems of spiritual disillusionment, and the neglect that comes with people that suffer through these patronizing experiences can be jarring. To go off the leftist cook's allegory, is the answer to shoot some politician who caused these patronizing experiences. I, I, I mean, it would feel good though, but no. As sad as it is, we're all living on a spectrum of conformity in tandem with wanting to be free. The concept of free is subjective. For trans people, it could just be wanting to exist. For black people, it could be seen as wanting to be more than just an amalgamation of cultural stereotypes that are emplaced on us. For poverty-stricken individuals, the answer could just be money. Freeness is as nuanced as a question as the ripple effects of patriarchy, racism, and disenfranchisement are. And although the moon is dark, it still shines. I don't believe martyrdom or suicide is something that should be actively sought after. Don't get me wrong, I fuck with John Wilkes Booth. But at this stage of neoliberalism, violence on a person-to-person -person level can actively be countered a million times over by the states. When social consciousness first rang through America with George Floyd, we rioted. We went insane. We called out for black rights. It was the closest in Gen Z history that we were to a perceivable revolution. I remember walking around the legislature with my sign I made a day before, marching around and yelling with almost a thousand other people, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. I gained so much confidence from that single event, I grew my locks out. I wanted to be black again. It was historically beautiful, beautiful. and I'll be telling my kids and my kids' kids about that how I felt that these white people were acknowledging my grievances that I faced on a day-to-day -day basis. But then, just like the sun, it passed. A month passed. And in a single bedroom apartment with my dad, I had to go out and apply for jobs in order to keep the electricity running. Just so I didn't have to walk over to the library in order to write some 10-page paper about the situation happening in Ukraine. Then being rejected again and again because of what I was so proud of and what those people were marching for only a month ago. My skin color and my hair. A martyr can cause a revolution, but the government's nigh infinite power can stop it in an instant. Even on a level of societal social consciousness, the government can and will stop the beautiful flames of liberation. But the flames of Milwaukee, California, New York, Boston, Atlanta, Florida, and right now, Paris, still burn bright in my heart. Matter of fact, every time I read the script, I still hear the chants. 
the chance of people who are trying to see what the Western world and all its institutional nuances made of my life. And even though those flames stopped burning and the people have since co-opted my revolution into a more cynical, woke mob, I still feel the flames. I don't want to die. I don't want to grow cold. January, I had a knife to my throat. I was home invaded. The perils of living in my disenfranchised area caught up to me, even though I was doing perceivably the best I've ever done in my life. I was branching out with creators and YouTube had just recognized me as a new black voice of 2023 and a knife was to my throat. Selfishly, my YouTube platform didn't run through my mind. My friends didn't run through my mind. My contract who just made me the most amount of money that I've ever made in my life did not run through my mind. The only thing I wanted to do was keep my family safe. My brothers were locked in the washroom and my sisters were thankfully not touched. But I was sitting there with a knife to my throat because I decided that the two kids standing outside of my house in negative 40 degree weather needed my help. After they left, I held my mother and brothers and sisters and I cried. I bawled my eyes out even though my mother had beat me since I could remember. Even though my brothers and I had an extreme disconnect. Even though my sisters didn't even experience what happened. I cried and held them as tight as I could, and I didn't come out with a renewed vigor on life. I came out of it with anger. I wanted to do something back. I wanted to make them pay how I paid. I wanted to fight, but I'm never going to. That's just not me. That was never the kid with light in his eyes, just wanted to be acknowledged by his peers. I'm not praising you and telling you to take the high ground in any given situation. Because in my opinion, if someone stoops low, you stomp that nigga out. Stomp him out! <laughs> but if I did something, if I enacted my own personal justice, I'd be in a cell for devastating someone's family. The crime here wasn't just a crime of home invasion. It's a crime of curated capitalist conditions manifesting on my jugular. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to be there by each and every one of my sister's sides when they receive awards because no one was there for mine. I want to monetarily support my brother's educational endeavors because no one was there to support mine. And even as painful as it is, I want to show my mom true happiness, even though she stripped me of mine. This convoluted spear of capitalism has made life horrible for everyone, and sometimes it manifests into the most evilest of ways. This home invasion took away my first laptop and phone I bought with my student tuition I purchased off working three jobs, the one I first posted my first YouTube video with, and patented my editing style. The one I first messaged Uncle Fick with and met all these amazing creators on. The one I first built my initial platform and rose out of poverty on. And even with everything stolen. The next day, I went out and got an even more expensive laptop that runs way more better than that piece of junk ever did. Thanks to you guys and the platform that I've curated. But what's your reason for living? Because we all need one. Especially now. Grandeurs of spiritual and physical prominence may keep you going. But what right now are you living for amongst the trans genocide, amongst black oppression, amongst the homeless crisis, amongst the million systems of exploitation actively harming you and everyone right now? What are you living for? In fact, this whole video is a ruse. What are you living for? I can't answer that question for you. It's nigh impossible. The intricacies of gender, race, and circumstances account for an endless spectrum of possibilities for your life to fall into. And most of them, I hope, aren't as extreme as mine. So please, remind yourself what you're living for. Find your shine in your own mood. Be nice to yourself. Remind yourself that your experiences and feelings are valid every day by actively trying to make change. Maybe fight for a cause. Or even if it's just to water the flowers sitting by your window. No matter how big or small, life is worth living. And I hope you know that you're beautiful no matter how frustratingly hard this world tries to tell you that your existence is not. Be you. It's the best thing that you could be. Thank you for listening. This was probably the hardest video that I've had to make, but I made it selfishly to remind myself that through all the perils that I've gone through, I need to find a reason to live. I want to live. And I'm trying to have that reflected with you too. I hope you took a thing or two from it. And I hope that you're doing well right now. I hope that the sun is beaming on you. I hope that you have a lot of people around you that love you for you right now. I hope that everything goes extremely well with you and i hope that life is good to you right now even though it's not the best for us right now in a lot of regards thank you to all my patreons that have um subscribed for the last couple months 
um we've grown so much we've grown so fast so quickly yeah thank y'all y'all actively help me eat ice cream sandwiches and make better videos thank y'all thank you neil for editing this video it was actually neil that edited it from start to finish so go to the leftist cooks so this video is kind of a continuation of their video called this is not a video essay it heavily inspired this whole video was heavily inspired by it so go watch that i'll have it in my description thank you guys for watching i'll see y'all later and peace